let's uh, pick up where we left off last time. If you remember, the last thing we talked about was Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. And Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization allowed us to extract the basis of, a, of the signal set. If somebody gives you a set of signals, we learn how to determine a smaller set of fundamental signals that can be used to build all the signals in a given set. Uh, so, uh, here is what we, what we start. Uh, let me just uh, kind of draw a graph that we did from the last time. This is an interval from A to B. This is an interval I. And we envisioned M different uh, signals on that interval as 2 of T all the way to S M of T. Now, there is no there is no secret even at this point. This interval is going to be our signaling interval, or what we call symbol interval. Right? Every symbol interval, you're going to send one of these waveforms to the other side. Now, what we've learned last time is that uh, all of these S, S of T can be expressed in terms of our basis signals, which we call psi of T. So, SM of T can be expressed as sum when uh, M goes from 1 to uh, capital N, where N is the size of the basis of your, of your signal set. There will be a SMN and then times psi N of T. These psi's are the actual basis signals which we saw that through the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization there are going to be of a unit norm, and they're going to be mutually orthogonal. They're mutually orthogonal by construction. Uh, how do we determine these, these constants, SMN? SMN is the coordinate of this particular vector or this particular signal in a basis formed by these uh, basis signals. So how do we determine the coordinate? You take the projection of the vector to a particular basis vector. Or here, you take the projection of the signal to a basis to a signal. Projection is another word for what? For dot product, okay. right? So this SMN are going to be determined as SM of t in dot product with psi n of t. This is our formal notation, or really, it is an integral over the interval i, SM of t times psi n of t d t. Okay, so that's a that's a decomposition and you kind of learn now if I if I uh, so let me do one more thing before I uh, generalize all of these conclusions into a couple of uh, drawings. Let's uh, look at the energy of the signal. Energy of the signal. All the Now, energy is, a, is a, our good old friend. We know how to determine the energy of the end signal. It is going to be integral over i, s m squared of t, dt. That's our, that's our definition of how we calculate the energy. But let's look at the energy in terms of all of these basis factors. So based on what I have so far, I can say that this is an integral over i. s m of t, I'm going to write it as a sum when n goes from 1 to capital N, SMN times psi n of t, and then I have to square the whole thing times dt, uh, right? What did I do? Nothing. I just took this SM of t and I represented, uh, put it into this expression for calculation of the signal energy. Now, this I can play a little bit with it, and I say this is some uh, uh, integral over uh, length of uh, over the interval i, sum when n goes from 1 to n, <coughs> s n, and uh, s n n, right? s m n uh, squared times sine n squared of t, plus 2 times sum when n goes from 1 to n, and sum when k goes from 1 to n, uh, s, m, n, s, 
M K psi um, N of T times psi of K of T, and then everything dt. What is this? This is just this thing squared, right? And you have this is binomial expansion, so you have the the all the alike terms here, and then all the cross terms in this section here. Now. I can uh, let the integral go through these summations because both of them are linear operators. So this becomes sum when n goes from 1 to n, s m n squared, integral over i, psi n squared of t dt, and then plus 2 times integral sum when n goes from 1 to n, sum when k goes from 1 to n, s m n, s m k, integral over the interval i psi n of t times psi k of t d t. Now, what is the value of this integral? What is the value of that integral? It's a, it's a unit signal in dot product with itself. So it's a norm of the unit signal. What is the norm of this guy? 1 by construction, right? So this is 1. So this is equal sum, n goes from 1 to n, smn squared. Plus, what is this? This is a dot product between be zero. two zero. bases zero. signals. So this is zero. 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 So I'm going to put it here. So this is equal to zero. So if you look at now, what is? how do we calculate the energy? We can calculate it by doing this integral, or we can calculate it by taking the the, each of the coordinates squaring and adding them together. So this is the distance from the origin of the vector squared. Okay? Is, does that remain as capital N on the second summation? Mm -hmm. uh, it's all capital N. It goes up to N basis N. vectors. So all of these are capital N. The, the N and K, do you have to specify that N is not equal to K and uh, that double sum? Oh, of course. N is different than K. Because N equal K, I or, I'm already here. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are the other ones. Sorry, I forgot that. <clears throat> so here's what we do. We say, okay, we have two domains. We have a signal domain. And we have a uh, here vector domain. Sometimes called signal space, <coughs> which is a vector space associated with the signals. This is where our signals live and exist. This is a time domain. And every one of the signals, this is what, what we have. <coughs> so we have here S M of T where n goes from 1 all the way to capital N. But if I take now SM of t, I can write that SM of t in this domain as a sum when uh, n goes from 1 to capital N, SMN times psi n of t. This is our Grassmith orthogonalization decomposition, where I can say that I can take this SM of t signal and build it out of these basis signals, psi n of t. The, in a vector space domain, I can represent, now assign a vector Sm that is going to be a vector, n-dimensional vector, Sm1, Sm2, all the way to Sm and transpose, because I like my vectors to be column vectors. But this is a vector in this space associated with the signal. What I'm really hiding in this representation, there are no psi's. But psi's, I know up front what they are. So I'm not really bothersome about you know, remembering them. All I need to know is what the coordinates are. And I can always build my signal using this. But right now, I'm just saving n different coordinates, n different numbers. Now, I have complete analogy here. If I look at dot product between SM of t and SN of t, in this space, this is equal to integral i uh, SM of t 
times Sn of t dt. So this is how I calculate dot product in a signal domain. In this domain here, let's uh, let's figure out what this what this will be in that domain. I, I kind of should have done that. Um, let me do it over here. So this should have gone before this drawing, but let's let's take a look at this dot product of Sn of t and Sn of t is by definition an integral over i Sm of t times Sn of t dt. Well, I can, I can write this as an integral over i sum when n goes from 1 through n Smn. Maybe uh, n is not the best choice here. So let me p goes Smp times 5p of t. So that's the decomposition of Sm times sum when Q goes from 1 through N, Snq times 5Q of T dt. What did I do here? Instead of Sm of T and Sn of T, I wrote their decompositions along the basis signals. Right? So I see Sm of T as a weighted sum of these psi's, and then I see the same way Sn of T. These are the coordinates of these two uh, signals along the basis signals. So now I can say that this is sum. P goes from 1 through n. Sum. Q goes from 1 through n. Smp times Snq times an integral over i. 5p of t times 5q of t dt. Now tell me, what is the value of this integral? Well, it depends what P and Q are. If P is equal to Q, then it's 1. If P is different than Q, it's 0. So we put that in notation as delta PQ, knowing that delta PQ is equal to 1 if P is equal to Q and, and 0 otherwise. So this double sum here is really not a double sum. Out of all the terms, the only ones that matters are the ones where p is equal to q. So I can collapse this double sum into single sum. p goes from 1 to n. Smp times Smq. And guess what? This I can write as Sm transpose times Sn, where Sn and Sn are corresponding vectors, and then this is a dot product of the two corresponding vectors. So what I can do here as an integral actually maps into S m transpose times S n. So dot product in this uh, domain maps into a dot product in this domain. <coughs> but what is the difference? In order to do dot product here, I have to do an integral. In order to do a dot product here, I just do, do a sum, right? So it's much easier to do algebra than it is to do calculus. So we like viewing things uh, in this, uh, in this, in working, operating in this domain uh, more um, readily. The further, the, so this is a point one. This is point two, and finally the third point. We define the energy. We looked at the norm of the vector Sm, and we defined it as Sm in dot product with Sm of t. Taken the square root, and we discovered that this is the square root of energy, right? Mm -hmm. Of the of the signal. This is how we define the norm of the signal. Now, if you do the same thing here. If I take a dot product between, uh, we, I already saw that the, the dot product is essentially the equivalent to the dot product in this, in this domain. So I can calculate here the energy of the signal or energy of the vector as Sm transpose times Sm square root of half. And then if you do this, you really see that this is the square root of sum n goes from 1 through capital N, Sm, n squared, which is, again, 
our distance from the origin. So there's a complete duality between the signal domain and signal space domain. And uh, if, even though in the actuality, when we signal, we're going to be sending these waveforms, what I'm going to be conceptually talking about is sending vectors to the other side. And our principle, that's what our modulation is going to be take a bunch of bits from the, the transmission side and pick a vector that you're going to send. And our demodulation is going to be, is de 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 demodulation detection is going to be decision on which vector was sent on the transmission side. We're going to be talking a lot about vectors but realizing that we are actually talking about real voltages and currents, but we just want like to see them in this domain rather than this domain. Now, in this domain, this is, this is another picture that is very useful. We already uh, decomposed our signals on a ba uh, along uh, these basis, basis signals, or in this case, basis vector. If I look at my psi, any, if I take psi here and I say, well, what is the psi decomposed along these psi vectors? So this is psi 1, unit vector in this direction. This is unit vector in this direction. This, these are my basis vectors. And then any other vector can be see a point in this, in this space here. So this is S, for example, 1, which is S11 1, 1 times psi 1 plus S11 1, 1, uh, times, or I use the underline, times S12 times psi 2 plus S13 times psi 3. This is how we represent this in a, in a vector domain. It's the same as saying this, right? But here we're dealing with the signals waveforms, and here we're dealing with the uh, vectors. Okay? All right. So, so that's, uh, that's how I see my, we're going to start seeing our transmission. We're going to be sending signals, but I'm going to be conceptually talking about picking one of the vectors. And depending on how many uh, vectors are in my basis set, how many sides I have, we're going to be talking about different types of signal. If in the most trivial case, uh, the num n is going to be equal to 1. I'm going to have only one basis vector. And in this case, I'm going to be talking about one-dimensional signal. In, in a more advanced case, n is going to be equal to 2, in which case I have two-dimensional signal. And you can extrapolate. You can have three-dimensional, four-dimensional, and so on. So let me start today by introducing one-dimensional signal. Go ahead. Which one is side 3? It's a so the vertical <coughs> ones, uh, that's the side three, right? Yeah. Okay. Stage does the uh, balancing or unbalancing of entropy happen? Uh, like, that sounds like a philosophical question. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, balancing, what do you mean by balancing? First, the first, we, we, proper first we balance it out, then we find out that we have to. to the, have we, we, uh, we do, you mean at the, at, the, at the beginning, we actually do all the encoding stuff. And encoding is done first by statistical encoding to remove the redundancy. And then through error control coding to bring in some redundancy to make it, uh, make it more robust to where all the channel impairments, right? And we call that error control coding. But at that point, you have this modem in between. Modem <coughs> is largely oblivious on what is being fed at the input and what is coming in the output, right? Modem, uh, or at least how we're going to talk about it here, its sole purpose is going to be to take these ones and zeros that are coming on this side and produce them on the output. One right? zero. <coughs> Go ahead. I mean, like, 
from the input you have like um, uh, digital and the output also the digital? Yeah, I mean everything is, is digital. Here, here's what, what we are talking about. There is a this there's a signal here. There is a, all of this analog to digital processing that produces zeros and ones here. Right? right. And that's a filters. Right? This is so, taking question. everything into account that we've talked so far about. Sampling, quantization, statistical encoding and uh, error control coding with all the information theory background. But then at that point you just have numbers. And what uh, we realize, you cannot really send numbers, right? You have to, this is an analog world, so you have to translate this into some voltages and kinds. The process of doing that is you transition from these numbers into some signals. And we call that modulation, where you somehow take a bunch of signals and you modify them in a way so that they carry these ones and zeros inside of them, right? Without undoing the statistical... You don't even know, this, nor even care. At this point, you just have ones and zeros. You hope that all the coding and all of that is done, but ultimately from the standpoint of this guy, it's not a concern. You are, you are getting ones and zeros. It's like a FedEx guy, you know. He doesn't necessarily care what's in the package. I'm sending this and then I need to deliver that on the, on the other side, right? It's up to you to worry what's in the package. So it's up to bigger design of the communication system to make sure that this is efficient as it can be. Sometimes it's not even warrant the effort, right? If, uh, if this is something that can operate with least effi less efficiency, then you just sample and quantize and just send it, right? You don't worry about any of this, of this stuff. But a lot of times you worry, and the majority of times you do. But from the standpoint of modulator, He's getting ones and zeros and you know needs to do the modulation and send it into a channel. And there's gonna be another guy here, demodulator, that is going to receive these ones and zeros and then uh, all these signals and it will try to detect and reconstruct ones and zeros. That's the most simplistic way. And uh, it is kind of easy conceptually because everything is separate. But what you find out is that, that there are benefits that to be drawn when you're actually uh, merging some of these two. And the common thing to merge is what is called modulation and, and error control coding, right? And then you have things like a trellis coded modulation and all the convolutional encoding and all that. But that comes a little bit later. Let's, let's you know, once, you, once we understand all of this, then we're gonna go back and say, where, where, is, where are the benefits that we missed? And I'll point them out as we get there. But let's kind of push it through to understand the most fundamental way of doing this, and then we'll kind of go step up and see what are the sum of the corners that we got. But for, for right now, you have a modulator coming ones and zeros. It will take a, a certain number of these bits and declare it as a symbol, and based on, on which symbol it has, it will pick one of the M available waveforms or M available vectors and send it to the other side. And then the channel will deliver that, attenuate it, and corrupt it with noise. And then the modulator will have to receive the signal and decide what has actually been sent. So in this case, we can see the factors between the signal domain and factors domain in the modulations. We're going to be, uh, the, the signal domain is the only one that physically exists. But it's messy. It's full of integrals and full of you know, uh, things that we cannot easily see. We're going to be realizing that things are happening here. But our preferred view of an explanation of what is happening here would be by its analogy in the, in the, the signal factor. space domain. This is not the first time we're doing it. You know, you know, we like doing this, and we are very familiar with the whole concept that sometimes when you look at it in this domain, it, it is much easier to understand what's happening than in the actual domain where the things are happening. We had a Fourier transform. You know, Fourier transform is the prime Fourier example. Of them. If you try to explain filter in the time domain, <laughs> it's a convolution. Right. And even in its most in uh, the say, benign form, it's still a beast to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. But when you look at it in a frequency domain, it's you say, oh, this filter cuts this out and lets this go in. And, and it's very easy to understand, right, what it's doing, right? So that's why we like all, all this 
filter in domain. And that's, you know, we looked at Fourier transform, with Laplace transform, Z transform, all of these transforms that kind of allow us to see this new time domain that we live in in a different light so that we can understand it better. Here it's not any different. We have this time domain. But, you know, here I'm going to say, okay, in time domain, I'm going to take a signal and correlate it with, uh, with uh, in a time domain with uh, one of the basis signals. And then you're going to say, well, why are you doing that? And then what, we, what we're going to say, well, let's see what does that mean in, in this domain. And then you will see, oh, correlation is nothing but a dot product. So I'm having two vectors, and I'm really trying to determine which is the closest to this vector. And I'm taking a dot product, and if you're like this, you're not close. You're orthogonal, right? But if you're like this, you're very close, right? If you're like this, you're still close but opposite, right? Maybe I just messed up the face, right? So we'll see. So the big part here is this is the world. And every now and then I'm going to actually all the time keep this in mind. But our view of what is actually happening is going to be much clearer in this domain, conceptually, you know. And, and then we're going to reason from this domain, always checking, you know. Can I say signal space is a frequency domain? No, no right. signal space is it's a separate not, domain. Yeah, it's not separate uh, domain. Now we have, we have, uh, you know, three domains, right? You start with your time, and then frequency. there's still going to be frequency, right? Right. That's the other side of the mirror, but here we're going to have space, right? Space domain, signal space domain, vector domain, right? And we're going to be working in all of this. Uh, it's of our interest to understand, time is where we live, right? Right. Time but it's, 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 a, it's a very big interest for us to understand the frequency because most of the time when we design our communication systems, especially at the component level, based you're going to be domain. buying based on frequency domain. I need an amplifier between 2.4 and 2.483 megahertz that has this amplification and this, you know, whatever, right? Characteristic is frequency domain. But then here, we're going to be looking at things like error vector magnitude. We're going to be looking at our constellations. We're going to be looking at, uh, you know, pilot symbols. You know, the distance between the symbols, yeah, probability of error, and all yeah. that stuff. So, you know, depending which, because in, in theory you can do any of these in any one of those, those domains, but it becomes much much difficult if you don't choose a proper proper domain, right? <coughs> So far, it's ab abstract, but really, you know, it's it's uh, it's going to become really, really uh, easy or easy, much concrete as of right now. So let's take a look at first type of signaling, which is going to be one-dimensional signaling, and I'm going to call it pulse amplitude modulation. Pulse amplitude. So this is one dimensional signaling. Which means n is gonna be equal to one. We're also gonna look at consider pulse amplitude modulation in AWGN. The assumption of AWGN is still very important for us here. Most of the time you're not signaling in AWGN. But what is important for us are two aspects of this channel. First is type of the impairment it produces. And this is just white noise, white Gaussian noise. But the other aspect is, is even more important. And that's the aspect that AWGN is infinite in frequency domain. It is a flat across all frequencies. Therefore, it's not doing filtering on, on our signals. What I send is going to be corrupted by voice. Uh, by noise, but it's not going to change its shape, right? The, if I send square pulse, I get the square pulse, right? And you know very well that to transmit a square pulse, how much of a bandwidth you need theoretically? Infinitely, because it's a sink in a frequency domain. 
So, uh, so here I have uh, one basis vector, so basis signal or vector. Let's call it psi of t. And uh, I'm uh, signaling by uh, scaling this vector through, uh, through you know, uh, different, uh, uh, giving different amplitudes to, to this particular vector. In the most simple case, the simplest, simplest, <coughs> let me explain that one first, simplest uh, pulse amplitude modulation is something that's called binary. Pulse amplitude modulation, and here you have n equal to one, and m equal to two. So you just have two signals in your signal set, and they're both made out of this uh, single, single uh, uh, basis signal. So, for example, let's say I have zero and one, two uh, symbols to send. Uh, I map zero in a time psi of t, this is my s1 of t, and I map 1 into minus a times psi of t, which is my s2 of t. So it's very simple. I get a bunch of bits coming in. Wherever I have 0, I send s1 of t, which is a times psi 1 of t. If I have 1, I send minus a times psi of t, which is s2 of t. So it's very, very simple. This is, as a matter of fact, how, you know, S1. on the outset we all imagine digital to work, right? You have ones and zeros, and then for zero you send a positive pulse, for one you send negative pulse, and then you receive that on the other side. What's the significance of N and M? Oh, okay, N is the number of these guys, and here I have only one. So n is equal to 1 in this case, basis vector. m is the number of signals in my constellation. And then I have 2, s1 and s2. But they are dependent, right? They're not independent. They're both derived from this single basis vector or basis signal, right? So this, that's why this is one-dimensional signal, because I, I have one dimension even though I have two signals, right? I'll show you a little bit later how you generalize this into cases where n is still equal to 1, but m is, let's say, 4 or 8 or 16. Right? This is what is called emery pulse amplitude modulation. Right? So let's uh, look at a uh, uh, simple example. Actually, I'm going to uh, uh, generalize that right away. So uh, let's take a look at an example here. Now, I'm going to have an example where n is still equal to 1 and m is equal to 4. So I have four different signals in my set. Uh, four signals in my signaling set allows me to encode two bits at a time, right? Because based on a two-bit combination, I have ability to choose one of the signals. So let's uh, look at these two bits, b1 and b2. And let's say I have 0, 0, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And this is my SI of T. Now, when 0, 0 comes, I'm going to send, let's say, 3 times A times Psi of T. Here I'm going to say A times Psi of T. Here I'm going to say minus A times Psi of T. And here I'm going to say, send minus 3a times psi of t. Is that the condition? No, this is just an example. Um, example right? This is four level or four pulse amplitude modulation, right? Because you have four levels and you're encoding each one of them by scaling your pulse properly. So this signal here, the first one, looks like this. Uh, this is S1 of T, S2 of T, looks like this, S3 of T, 
looks like this. And then S4 of T looks like this, right? right. Now, if you do Gram Schmidt orthogonalization on this, how many basis vectors you're going to get? No. Two. No. One. 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 <laughs> right? One. The, this psi of t, right? And you're going to form the first one by three times some magnitude times that. This one, one times, minus one times, minus three times, right? So this is 3a here. This is a. This is minus a. And minus 3a. If I were to represent this in a vector domain, this is my s signal space now. I'm going to have, this is my psi vector. And where are my vector points? They are here. This is minus 3a, minus a, a, and 3a. And this is my s1 vector, s2, s3, s4. This is one dimensional signaling, n is equal to 1. So you have only one dimension, right? And, uh, yeah, so, sorry. This is S4, S3, S2, S1. That's the other way around, right? Because I started from, from the highest to the lowest. <laughs> now, conceptually, this psi of t is going to be some pulse in time domain. And uh, let's say it might look usually, even though we're talking about uh, about uh, AWGN, we do an e make an effort to round these pulses so that they're not, you know, really square pulses with an infinite cushion. So I'm going to say that this phi of t, or usually I'm going to write it as g of t with square root of epsilon g to make it, uh, make it uh, normalized. So let's say this is some sort of pulse, let's say Gaussian pulse divided by the energy to make the energy of this equal to. What is g of t? Huh? What is g of t? g t of t g is g this pulse here that exists uh, in this period t, by uh, signaling period. T, t of t is signaling period. So that's a typical shape of, of a basis function here. Right? So if your signal, you know, and you, let's say zero, zero comes, you're going to take this pulse, multiply by three, and this goes on to the line. And then, you know, the next one and the next one and so on. So just to complete, uh, uh, let's take a look at energy of a pump signal. Energy is, you know, integral over the interval, signaling interval, s m squared of t dt. In our case, this becomes an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, a m times uh, times your g of t. Uh, let me correct this. This is not correct what I have in notes here. So it's AM times psi of T, which is your S, uh, S. S uh, M of T squared D T. So this is going to be equal to AM squared times integral from minus infinity to plus infinity psi squared of T D T, which is just AM squared. So what you realize here is when you have a multi-level pump, you have, you have to deal with signals in your set which are of a different energy. So the energy is different between the individual signals. Excuse me, Professor. That becomes a little bit uh, uh, important, more important when we start introducing noise because you will find out that uh, your ability to decide what has been said is <coughs> dependent on the energy. Go ahead. 
So what is the relation between the AWGN with the the B1 and the B2 of the <coughs> or PAN? You have already like the no, the the bits over there, and then you have the energy of a signal. How do you calculate that? I have. The, the so what is the relation between the between the AWGN and yeah. or any one of these? Yeah. AWGN is just a channel that I'm sending all of this through. So We're going to bring AWGN later when I, when we start calculating the, the probability of error and those kind of things. Oh. So far, I'm just I'm just uh, saying, you know, what can we this see? This is the channel. So far, I haven't used channel for anything. Okay. I'm still just uh, talking about how you actually uh, module it. So uh, there is a. Uh, what I've shown you so far is what is called baseband pulse amplitude modulation. Why is it baseband? Because, because this pulse this. exists around yeah. the orange. There is another way how we do this. It's called passband pulse amplitude modulation. So, or band pass, I think that's how he calls it in the book. Pulse amplitude modulation. Uh, here, the way how you create this one is you have SM of T, which is one of your baseband type. This is baseband. And then you multiply this with a, a cosine 2 pi FCT. And then you get really SM of T times cosine 2 pi FCT. And this is now the signal that you that you're sending. So let's say four-way uh, bandpass pump would take all of these four signals and a pen cosine here at the end, essentially translating the entire spectrum of the signal to the frequency around the carrier. Here, if I look at let's call this a UM signal to make a distinction between uh, base band and uh, UM bandpass. So UM of t is going to be equal to am times gp of t divided by, I guess, square root of energy times cosine 2 pi f0 t, which if you look at it now, uh, well, this is now the new basis vector that I can be using. And I can say that this is equal to AM times sine band pass of T. The last thing I want to uh, just mention here, let's see energy of uh, band pass. would be, let's say, EM in this case, integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, UM squared of T dt. <coughs> and that is integral of minus infinity to plus infinity, AM squared GT squared of T divided by square root of uh, energy squared times essentially UG. Now, I didn't define this, but this EG is an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity GT squared of T dt. In other words, the energy of these paths. So we normalize this whole thing so that the psi of T is of a unit energy. So if I square, and then I have cosine squared 2 pi F0 T. T. Now, <coughs> this integral I can write as uh, AM squared over energy G T squared 1 plus cosine 2 pi 2 F 0 T D T. What's the value of this integral? One. 
um, it splits into two integrals, right? Yeah. One is an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, gt squared Square. dt. That's, that's the energy, right? G. Yeah. So this is the energy, and it cancels with this one. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, gt squared cosine 2 pi 2 f 0 t. Yeah. Zero. And the energy, zero. That, that is zero, zero. provided what, that f0 is much higher than the higher than the bandwidth of G T T O T right so that you're far enough in frequency that your DC component is equal to zero. So this is AM squared over two. And it's a half of what you what you get over here. Okay. So so pulse amplitude modulation is very, very simple. So let's not let's not uh, dwell too much about it. It's uh, one dimensional and really what you're doing is you're, you're selecting a combination of bits and then you're sending one of uh, the waveforms that you have in your symbol set, in your signal set. Each one of the waveforms is derived from some basic waveform by proper amplitude scale. And usually we have, you know, either two or four or some uh, some uh, power of two number of uh, waveforms in our signal set. Excuse me, Professor. Uh -huh. So in the PAM, so we just only need to focus on the like uh, psi of t. Is that it? Basis of the signal. Yeah, it's just that everything is derived from that one signal. So because you have one dimensional. Yeah, one dimensional. Correct. Let's take a look at more uh, more um, interesting case, and this is a case of two dimensional signal. Here we're going to have two vectors, basis, basis signals or basis vectors that we use for signal. We can select those vectors in, in several different ways, but uh, we're actually in almost all circumstances select them to be orthogonal, right? And, uh, Right now, I can just say that that makes sense, but later on you will see that why does it make sense? Because you want to maximize the distance between them and make the system uh, look more robust uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to when it comes to noise. So. So let me first illustrate what does it mean to have two-dimensional signaling. And uh, deliberately in doing that, I'm going to follow a book and I'm going to kind of introduce two signals that are just orthogonal. Not necessarily the, the ones that we use in, in most cases, but I actually want to go away from the, uh, the most common ones so that you get, get the concepts of orthogonality independent from sine and cosine. <coughs> so, two-dimensional signal. So, um, let me uh, pick two signals. Uh, here, n is going to be equal to 2. And let me start by n equal to 2. And I'm going to have two signals, S1 and S2. And uh, let me give you two examples. Let's say this is my signaling interval from 0 to t. t is, uh, uh, from 0 to t is the signaling interval. And uh, let me look at two examples. One example is S1 of t looks like this. S2 of t looks like this. So if 0 comes, I'm going to send this one. <coughs> if 1 comes, I'm going to send this one. Unlike the previous case, you see a difference between these two. They are not the same shape. 
there are different shapes. So this, as a matter of fact, these two are orthogonal, right? So they cannot be derived from a same basis spectrum. If I were to do this, I would actually, if I do Grand Schmidt orthogonalization of these two, I will end up with two different basis vectors, right? Um, so that's an example one. Another example that I want to put here deliberately, just to make you aware of, of a simple fact. Uh, and this is this one, that I can take this interval into two, and uh, I can declare this as one prime of t, as two prime of t. And these two are also orthogonal to each other. But there is something different between their, their orthogonalities. How am I making these two orthogonal? I'm actually making uh, them offset in a time domain. We can, you know, they don't exist in the same time. Therefore, the, their, uh, their product is always equal to zero. This is, let's say, p over 2. <coughs> So both of these sets can be seen as a uh, as a basis of uh, uh, can form a basis of a two a two dimensional space. So and mm -hmm. so, are you saying you are finding derivative of x one? Or no, no. I, I'm looking. This is an example one, example two. In 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 both cases, I have two signals, right? If I, if I just select to keep these two signals, then I'm actually uh, 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 having a, this case where n is equal to 2 and m is equal to 2, right? Which means my number of basis vectors is 2, and the number of signals in my signaling set is 2 as well. So how many bits per symbol I'm going to have here? One, right? If zero comes, this is what goes on the line. If one comes, this is what goes on the line. That's one example. The second example is very much the same. I have two signals. They're both uh, they're both uh, uh, orthogonal, and uh, and uh, I can use both. Uh, if if zero comes, I send this. If one comes, I send this, right? But unlike the previous case in which I had one-dimensional signaling. These two are orthogonal to each other, so I cannot. I need two basis vectors to express, you know, each one of them. Now you can uh, use this. Uh, you can expand this, and you can say, okay, let me look at now. Uh, so this is one. Let's look at now the case when n is equal still to, but let's say m is equal to 4, right? So I want to have uh, 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 four different signals, and n is equal to 2. <coughs> now let me draw this and uh, uh, here, the four vectors, and then we'll explain why is that the case. So let's say my S1 of t looks like this. My S2 of t looks like this. My S3 of t looks like this. And my S4 of t looks like this. So how many vectors, how many sig signals do I have now in my signal set? I have four. And, uh, but I still have basis n equal two. How do I know that? Well, I can do Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, or I can pick two of these vectors and try to express all four of these vectors in terms of uh, two other ones, right? So let me pick, uh, let's say, Continue with the example one. Let's say psi one 
is going to be equal to this guy, but I need to normalize it. So if I normalize it, what's the area under the curve? Let's say this is 1, 1, 1. one. What's the area under the curve? T, 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 right? So let's say I pick psi 1 to be 1 over T times S1 of T, and I pick psi 2 to be 1 over T times S2 of T. So now S1 is obviously T times psi 1 of T. S2 is going to be T times psi 2 of T. How about S3? S3 will be S T over 2. It's going to be this plus this over 2, right? You see that? So it becomes T times T over 2 times psi 1 of T plus psi 2 of T. And then S3, S4 is what? Uh, T over 2 minus, right? Psi 1 of T minus psi 2 of T. Okay. So this is now two-dimensional signaling where n is equal to 2, where my basis vector is essentially these two guys. Let me kind of draw them here. The basis vector, first one, looks like this, t, and this is 1 over t. And the basis vector, second one, looks like this. <coughs> Minus one over t. Okay? And then I have uh, four signals that I use for signaling, and I can encode 0, 0 with this one, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay? So that's an example of two dimensional signaling where I have uh, m equal four signals in my signal set. And let me just go one more example. This is going to be example two, just to practice this a little bit. I'm going to now take psi 1 of t to be 2 over t times, uh, times s3 of t and psi 2 of t to be 2 over t times s4 of t. Then how do I express s1 of t? S3 plus s, psi 1 plus psi 2. Psi 1 plus psi 2 times two times t over two. Right? So t over two psi one of t plus psi two of t or minus. You know plus. No? Plus. Plus, yeah. Nice. Then S two of t is gonna be t over two psi one of t minus psi two of t. S three of t is going to be t over 2 times psi 1 of t, and s4 of t is going to be t over 2 psi 2 of t. Now if I were to draw the geometrical representation here, let's just do that real quick. This is psi 1, this is psi 2 in this scenario. Where is s1? Here. This is s1. Where is s2? Here, this is S2. Where is S3? T over 2, Psi 1 plus Psi 2. So this is S3. And where is S4? T over 2, Psi 1, minus Psi 2. So this is S4. Right? <coughs> so that's a that's a signal space representation of these waveforms that I see here, right? If I already s select psi 1 and psi 2, then I have these points already selected in this signal space plane, right? Let's do the exercise here as well. This is psi 1, this is psi 2, in this, in this case here, let me, so that we don't confuse them, let's call these primes. So that they are different than the other ones. So now, where is S1? It's T over 2, Psi 1 plus Psi 2. So let's say this is T, T. So this is where S1 is. 
where is S2? T over 2 psi 1 minus psi 2, so this is S2. Where is S3? S3 is here. And where is S4? So this is S3, S4. Now, uh, this view is called constellation, right? And this is what we, what is somehow more clear to us, right? And you will see later on, this is going to be preferred way of how I see the signals that we use for signal, right? So uh, this is a constellation of the same signals, but when Psi 1 prime and Psi 2 prime are, are chosen as a basis. And this is the, the exactly the same signals, but now these two guys are chosen for basis. Okay, any questions here? Yes. Uh -huh. Why the Psi 1 and Psi 2, both of the example 1 X and example 2, they, they actually they have almost the same value, 1 over T as, as 1 of T and 1 over T as 1 of uh, 2 of T, but why why do we need like put the uh, the the S one into like the horizontal value of the vectors and the how do we describe it actually? That's my question. Well, how how can we see it? This is this is reality, right? This is what I'm signaling. Whenever zero zero comes, I send this one mm -hmm. zero one one zero one one. Uh, <coughs> now I can see this two different ways. I can see these four signals as being built out of these two vectors or these two vectors. <coughs> right, so this is a psi 1 prime of t and psi 2 prime of t. Right? This is t. And, uh, uh, by doing so, then I end up actually uh, with these two constellations. These two are the views of this exactly same for waveforms. But in the signal space. In the signal space domain, with a different basis signals. This one here has a different basis signal than this one, right? Mm. And uh, I'm just plotting the points, right? Now, at this point, you say, why do I even care about it, right? And the answer is going to come uh, later when we start detecting what has actually been sent. And you will see, for example, out of these two, that uh, this one is slightly better way of seeing things. You're going to be able to detect much a little bit better by seeing it this way than this way. Because now you you're going to learn why later. Because you have the coordinate? Because here, the distance you can calculate the distance. Well, actually, am I wrong? I'm yeah, wrong. that's yeah. Like I, should I'm be wrong. This. Yeah, this yeah. one is easier, right? Because the yeah. distance here is larger. The, sh the smallest distance here is t over 2 square root of 2. The smallest distance here is t, over, t over 2. two. So mm -hmm. these signals are more separate, and therefore it's going to be easier for the receiver to decode it this way. And that will, you know, translate in how I do correlation and so on. But so far, what I would like you to understand is, is this particular view of things. You know, I have four signals, n is equal to two at the basis, and I can form four signals here. I can form how many signals I can form? Can I make it n equal two and m equal eight? Can, eight yes. You how? Can. Just need. You eight, just need. Eight, 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 I actually it's the easiest number. to work in this space. <laughs> right. Why don't I pick four more? Let's say I pick one here, one here. And what would make this symmetric? Let's say here. And what else do I? Need? And here. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Below. 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 Yeah. And uh, and here. Right. Minus t. Mm -hmm. So I end up with a now eight. Now how does this signal look like? This is minus yes. uh, t, t times psi one. one. I can form it from here. So this is my s five. S five looks like this. Right? And so on, right? So this way I can create, uh, what did I, I picked four and I had four, so eight 
m is equal to 8, and n is still equal to 2. So this is how I can now encode 3 bits per sim. Right? Like so you said you have like four, four number of m, then you have another number of m, but in the Now I have with these, with these, uh, with these uh, crosses, I have now 8. eight. You see 1, 2, 3, eight, four. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right. Right? And this 8 I can now use to encode 3 bits per waveform, right? And I can start growing this however I want and I end up, you know, with more and more symbols that are all built on the top of these two basic symbols, right? I'm still going to be talking about two-dimensional signaling, but my M is going to be much larger. I mean, what if, if the psi 1 and psi 2, it has a different value of a, like, like, like say, Psi 1 is 1 over t as 1 of t, and psi 2 is 1 over 2t as 2 of t. I mean, no, it cannot be. They, they have to be same. unit norm. Oh. Unit norm, norm, right? They have to be, this is 1 over t as 1 of t. If you, if you take the norm of this one, energy, <coughs> it's equal to 1. Square root of energy of both of these is equal to. They have to be unit vectors. This is psi 1 and psi 2 are unit vectors. Oh, that's right. So that's a, this is a little bit, I wanted to kind of go through the example because it is a little bit artificial because you usually don't select psi 1 and psi 2 here. But I want you to separate psi's and, and, uh, from s's. And uh, depending how many psi's you have, we're going to be talking about different, uh, le a different type of modulation scheme in terms of like one level, uh, one dimensional signaling, two dimensional or multi dimensional. But in each one of these dimensions, you can actually have more than uh, as many waveforms as you want. Even if in a wide dimension, I could have picked as many points along the single uh, axis as I want, right? And, uh, and here, you know, certainly in two dimensions, I can have the whole plane to choose from and uh, to create my S's. But it still doesn't change the fundamental fact that I have just two basis factors. Now, what we're going to do next time, we're going to actually do a really, uh, how do we, I'm going to talk about which size we do we really choose, because we don't, we don't choose like this, we usually choose uh, sine and cosine, because we, I know about them, they're orthogonal, and they're easy to manipulate, and, and based on those two basis factors, we can create a whole bunch of uh, modulation schemes that, uh, that, that are extensively used all sorts of systems and, and communication. Yeah. Another question. Go ahead. So in this case, so we can we can conclude that we will see all these things on the modulations only or after the modulation? This is modulation. What, what modulation is doing is essentially picking up the pair of or however many bits at the time and sending one of these S waveforms. So the mo what does modulation do? It, it does this translation from digital, digital domain into back into analog domain. But the signals that we are sending are not some arbitrary chosen signals. They are selected by us and they actually mean something. And the selection, for example, of this signal means that it's zero, zero, right? Sending on the line. And then if, I, if this happens to be on the line, that means if I'm receiver and I get this, then I know, oh, this means 1-1. One, one. Right. And in this case, I have 4, m equal 4. So every one of my signals carries 2 bits. In this case, I have 8 possible uh, signals. Signal. So therefore, I have a capability of encoding 3 at a time. Right. But your source is only two. I mean, like you have the number of images only two, and if you extend it to four, it means that you will. What is number two? Number of size. Size. Right. Yeah. But still, with two size, I can create as many, as many S's as I want to by picking different points in this plane. Right. That's the that's the whole point that I'm kind of driving here. <laughs> you know, I want you to de decouple these two. I mean, when I talk about uh, uh, any type of modulation, you can create as many S's as you want, right? But, uh, but uh, uh, when you try to demodulate, 
the way how you demodulate is going to depend on how many size. And then, why? What's your motivation for creating more S's? You want to have like uh, more bits yeah. per symbol, yeah. right? So right. to okay. slow down your signal. Okay. We'll talk in detail about that as well. But you need to do have a redundancy of that, and after that, have what? Redundancy. 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 redundancy is that we left that. We don't worry about it anymore. You know, redundancy was taken care of the, the encoding side, and all I'm looking at is now a bunch of zeros and ones. That I'm, that I'm imprinting into the signal. But because the last one you, you, you gave like the, the distance between T, S2 and S3, and then compare between the example one and example two. Uh, you, I have no basis for this right now. You know, why am I saying that I would like this better than this? We haven't covered that yet. Mm -hmm. This is something that you're going to learn. Why this is better than this. Is that, yeah. Yeah, we, we will have to learn, right? But, uh, but... Uh, Intuitively? Or hmm? Intuitively? No, no, no. <laughs> we're going to beat this to death. <laughs> so don't worry about it, we're going to get there. All right, so I guess that's it.